All right, welcome everyone. So we're still having some uh, some more attendees joining us. Um, so in the meantime, in the chat, if you guys want to introduce yourself, tell us where you're coming from, say hi from your city, country. Um, we'll be starting shortly. If you want to follow along and run the code, because today is going to be a very hands on, uh, while more technical by nature, where there will be some code, some demonstration. So if you want to follow along and run the things, you have the instruction on the Evanbright emails that you've received and also on the website of the event. Um, so you can go and download and make sure that you have the tools installed. If you're new at all this and you haven't installed anything yet, uh, I would recommend waiting maybe a little bit and do it after. We'll, we'll allow a bit of time after the call and after the presentation so that we can help people that want to install and run the, co the code uh, themselves. So looking at the chat, we definitely have people coming from all over the world, Germany, India, uh, Buenos Aires, UK, Canada, Hungary, damn, that's, that's pretty awesome. Um, so welcome to week two, day three of our BCI 101 online global series. Uh, so some of you might be new today. Some of you might be uh, people that have come from week one, week two that have attended uh, most of the events. Um, so today is a bit more technical than the previous ones. This week is more about the applications of BCIs. Um, next week is gonna be exciting. We'll hear about more about next, uh, next week later on at the end of the, the, the presentation today. Um, but uh, let's dive Dive right into it. For those who don't know who is uh, Neurotech X, uh, Neurotech X is a non for profit organization. Uh, the mission is to facilitate the advancement of neurotechnology. It's, a, it's community driven and it's a very bottom up organization. In order to facilitate the advancement of Neurotech, we do have three pillars that we focus on mainly the community, the education, and innovation. So the idea is that we do have a lot of initiatives where we bring the community together. We provide tools for education, whether it's more on the scientific side, more on the, uh, the technical side, like today's a good example. And then we believe that once people are connected, do have a strong network, have the tools and the knowledge in the field, then they can go and impact the field with either joining a venture startup uh, or uh, tackling big challenges in the field. So a couple of our initiatives, uh, just quickly, for those who've heard the, the Neurotech X spill before that I've attended most of the, uh, most of the events, I'll, uh, I'll stay quick and short today. Um, so we do have our chapters where we do uh, local events. Uh, obviously right now we're going more on live due to the current situation, um, but uh, you might have a local community in your city. So if you, uh, if you wanna connect after, we'll talk about Slack and how to get uh, involved as well in your local city. Um, we do have student clubs uh, around, the, around the world in different universities for undergrads mainly. Uh, we do have our Slack platform, an online community. Uh, we do have Neurotech X EDU, an educational platform, a newsletter, Neurotech X services as well. So we do have a couple of uh, initiatives. We're trying to address the field with a 360 degree angle. Um, we're international. We do have 20 chapters around the world. We've done many, many meetup events uh, from different sizes on different uh, subjects. Uh, we do have a lot of people across meetups, uh, just uh, over 15,000 members. We do have 23 student clubs, and uh, we recently reached the 4,000 4, members on Slack. So just quickly uh, about some of our initiatives or something that can bring value to, to some of you. Our Neurotech X job board is a very, very good resource if you're looking uh, for opportunities in the field, whether it's uh, for an academia position, PhD, master's, postdoc, uh, or more on the industry side of things that you're looking for, uh, for a job. We try to, uh, to have at least uh, like 30 industry position and 30 academia position a week. So that's probably the largest neurotech job board in the world. So really excited about that. So if you're looking for awesome opportunities in the field, please have a look at our job board. Uh, services, the idea behind Neurotech X services, which is a new 
branch of Neurotech X. Uh, it's a for-profit. The idea behind that is that we had a lot of people coming our way, uh, either on the supplier demand side, where a lot of the companies are reaching out uh, for uh, recruiting services that are looking for talent, or they do have some challenges that they would like some help for. Um, so we do offer consulting services and recruiting services. The idea is to leverage the community and then at work, as you've seen before, we do have a lot of people around the world in different places with different skills. So we're trying to leverage the community uh, to help the field uh, advance faster. So if you're not already on Slack, please join the, join the Slack. A lot of the discussions related to this series and beyond the series is happening on Slack. So I would invite you to join to uh, interact with a lot of people from around the world and even locally uh, these days. That could be a good uh, alternative for uh, instead of in-person meetings. So this series of event is really a collaboration between our Moscow chapter and London chapter. Um, so if you're not already following them on Twitter and different platforms, please do so. Uh, huge thank you for both teams that have been putting a lot of work to make this happen. Uh, for those who've been there for the, the previous events as well, we'll uh, definitely uh, appreciate all the work that's been put behind these events. Uh, we've had amazing guests and it's definitely not over. We still have another full week to go. Um, it, this series is also in collaboration with Skaltech, more precisely the Center for Neurobiology and Brain Restoration at Skaltech. Um, so if you want to know more about the, the, the university, which was co-founded in collaboration, well, founded in collaboration with MIT 2011, you have the URL uh, on the page here below. So. Today, I'm excited uh, because uh, it's going to be more on the coding side. Uh, my background is in computer science, uh, so that's more uh, also uh, the kind of thing that I do on a daily basis. So today, we're going to do some EEG analysis using MNE Python. And uh, David Asseler from Germany, a PhD student at uh, Charity uh, in Berlin, will give us a run through of the basics and then train a classifier on, the, on EEG data. So, just before we get started and I hand over the floor, I would ask uh, people that are on social media to, uh, we do have a uh, our contest, if you will, for Neurotech X swag. So if you're watching the stream right now, whether it's on YouTube, on Zoom, uh, and you're watching either from a TV, laptop, computer, do all monitor setup as we see here, uh, take a picture, a screen, ideally a picture, not just a screenshot, if you can take a picture of your setup and just send it with no personal confidential information and tag uh, Neurotech X and Skaltech RU uh, while using the hashtag NTXBCI101 uh, to make a bit more buzz and attract uh, Neurotech enthusiasts from around the world to attend the series, uh, not just live, but also on YouTube, all the recordings also available. Um, so with that being said, I'll stop sharing my screen and I will end it over to David, who's gonna run us through today's uh, tutorial. So David, the mic is yours. So hello, everyone. Um, you can see my screen now, I suppose. Um, so what I have open here is um, Visual Studio Code, um, a very nice lightweight uh, IDE, so a development environment. And for those of you who uh, followed the instructions and installed um, these things, I, I hope uh, some of you did so. If not, it's very easy and you can easily do so after the session. Um, so I have the code on the left side here and the basic setup is uh, for those of you familiar with Jupyter Notebooks, um, little code cells, which are delineated by these um, hash percent percent symbols. So what this means is that I can execute little bits and pieces of code and explain them um, as I go along bit by bit. Um, David, the I'm just gonna interrupt you a second. If you wanna open your camera, you, I think you, you close the camera during so that we can follow you better. Awesome. So now you should see my face as well. Back, back to um, you. The output of the code will be here on, on this uh, right panel um, and mostly we'll be looking at some interactive uh, plots to visualize the uh, EEG processing steps that we will do. 
So I've prepared two uh, basic scripts for you today um, on just basic EEG an analysis with uh, the MNE Python toolbox. And a second script where we'll go um, into depth, uh, well, a little bit into depth at least, into uh, classifying um, some motor imagery signals, EEG signals using this toolbox. So at the very top, the first thing we do is uh, we import the MNE package and of course the NumPy package. Um, the rest, the other two are not uh, actually necessary here, but MNE and NumPy are usually um, the first things that we import. And we're going to be taking a, examining a sample data set um, on audio and visual stimulation. So basically in this, uh, Experiment participants were exposed to very simple um, visual and auditory stimuli, little beeps or, or blinks. And we'll be looking at the um, evoked brain responses in the auditory and visual cortices, uh, respectively. So ME has a bunch of these um, um, prepackaged data sets integrated, which we can easily uh, um, download and, and um, open by simply calling these uh, three lines of code here. So this, this is basically in the MNE installation path, this data set, and then we read it using uh, MNE IO read raw uh, FIF. In this case, FIF is a very common neuroimaging format. Um, MNE has a bunch of other uh, read functions for all sorts of uh, EEG and MEG data formats. So whatever system you'll use, MNE will be able to read it basically. So we'll just run that code cell and have our data loaded. So here we see some basic information about uh, the EEG data. Um, how many channels, uh, how long it is and so forth. Now, you may notice that here it says MEG. Um, so this data set actually contains MEG and EEG recordings, but we're not gonna be looking at MEG. Um, so this is gonna be an EEG tutorial. So the next step we'll do is to um, get rid of the MEG channels in the data. So on this, uh, this is this raw uh, structure that we get. It's, it's we, I called this instance raw, but, um, it's actually a raw class. So the raw class is a very basic class in MNE where we have just raw data and it has this function called pick underscore types. And we use this to pick the EEG channels here, EEG equals true. And we get rid of the MEG channels. So we set that to false. Uh, we also keep the stim channels because this is where our trigger markers are saved and we keep the EOG channels. So that's electrooculography. These are the two electrodes that you place next to the eyes to measure eye movements. And one of the main reasons people do this is to be able to automatically reject eye movement artifacts from the EEG, which are, well, some of the biggest problems you have. So we'll run that as well. Now, one of the very first tasks that you'll do with well, electrophysiological data in general is to um, plot the power spectrum. And ME offers for, for all sorts of objects. So whether it's a raw object or epoch trials or, or average trials, otherwise known as evoked uh, responses, there will be a plot underscore PSD function. So power spectral density. And this function has a few parameters like the minimum frequency we want to see, the maximum frequency, and the number of FFT points. So the number of FFT points here refers to the fast Fourier transform. Um, and what this method basically does is it performs many Fourier transforms along the length of the data and then averages them to average out the noise. And the longer our individual Fourier transforms are, the more noise we have in our power spectral estimate. So this uh, parameter here is something you can set to get a more smooth or a more um, noisy, but also higher in frequency resolution power spectral estimate. 
And it's best if it's a power of two because then it's fastest. So we can uh, run that line and we should get this window um, that pops up. So this basically is the power spectrum of all EEG sensors in this data. Um, with the different locations here are colored conveniently um, in, in different colors. So we have the, the green sensors in the front and we have the purple and blue sensors um, in the back. And all, all plots or most plots in MNE are interactive. That means you can do stuff with your mouse, you can click and you can, for example, see the name of the EEG channels. Uh, inconveniently, this data set that we're currently using doesn't have the channels named according to the regular 1020 system. So usually, for example, the two channels over the visual cortex way in the back are called O1 and O2, as most of you probably know. Um, so usually you'll see those standard 1020 names here as you click on the individual lines, each of which is a power spectral density estimate. And here, um, right after 7.5 hertz, we have the we have a um, large peak in the theta frequency. And slightly after between 10 and 12 hertz, we have the um, expected alpha activity, which appears strongly in the parieto occipital brain areas. So the next thing we'll wanna do is to just get a feeling for how clean the data is by looking at the raw time series of each sensor. And we'll do that by simply calling the plot function of the raw object that we have. And we can pass it some parameters. So duration equals five, meaning we're gonna plot the first five seconds of data and n channels. So we'll, we'll look at like 30 channels. So that's what the data set looks like, the first five seconds at least. Um, so one thing you can do here is you can, if you don't like a channel and you wanna exclude it from the rest of your analysis because it looks terrible or you know it's, it, it, the impedance got loose, maybe the, the EEG cap uh, lifted the electrode up or what have you, you could simply click on that channel and it'll turn gray. And this means that it, it's added to the uh, so-called BADS list, which is uh, a part of the raw structure, and it'll be excluded from further analyses. So in this case, this, this gray EEG channel would not be integrated into any further analysis, automatically rejected. Um, on the bottom here, we have a little slider where we can uh, scroll through the data set. Here we see the um, length in seconds. And one of the very first things you'll notice if you look at the top few channels is that there are these large uh, bumpy patterns um, in like the first seven channels. So what this is, is, is an eye movement artifact. And something that people do to get rid of these eye movement artifacts, because of course we don't wanna measure them, is to just manually go through and, and mark those um, segments of data and reject them. So we can do that um, by annotating these segments of data by clicking and dragging with the mouse in MNE. Um, but first we have to make a marker. So we can press the A key and we can create a new label. So let's create this label bad underscore. And in MNE, all labels that start with bad, um, all, all segments of data that are marked with a label that starts with bad are automatically rejected from um, the data when you, when you cut it up into trials or epochs. So we have uh, selected this label and we can then click and drag with the left mouse button to create uh, this annotation. So we mark like this segment and this segment and this segment and then if we close this window and keep going, these three segments will be excluded from the trials that we're gonna cut up um, in a bit. But doing this is something that you can't do online when running a BCI, for example. So it's always nice for EEG data analysis when you have a method that automatically performs data cleaning for you. 
So I'm going to remove these uh, three, three annotations now, and I'm going to try to automatically remove uh, these eye movement artifacts using... Sorry? Using um, independent component analysis. So here in the next cell, uh, I initialize um, such an ICA object standing for independent component analysis. And the relevant um, parameter here is actually the number of components. And usually a value between 10 and 20 is, is uh, appropriate. Um, then we fit it, call the method fit and pass it the raw data. And then finally, we can plot the topography of these components where we can, then can click and select which ones we wanna um, throw out of the data. So the ones corresponding to eye movement artifacts or muscle artifacts, for example. So this is what the independent uh, component analysis decomposition of the data looks like. And on the top left, we see this uh, pattern, which is very strongly concentrated in the front. Um, now, this is one that we're gonna reject because this is obviously due to the eyes. These next two are, are somewhat, um, so this the second one is somewhat unclear. The third one is, is quite clearly parieto occipital brain activity to me. Now, this uh, next one, which has this bilateral um, sort of dipolar, um, thing at the front is very clearly, classically, what an eye movement artifact looks like. So this ICA003 is, we're going to click on it to reject it. Um, the same thing with ICA004. It has this very weird uh, structure at the front where the eyes are. We're going to reject that too. The number nine as well. Number eight has this very strong activation at a single sensor, and this is not physiological either. So we're gonna reject that too. Now, once we're done uh, selecting the topographies that look like they cannot be brain activity um, or look like they're obviously eye movement artifacts, uh, we can just close this window and then we can apply the ICA uh, artifact rejection to the data. But first I'm gonna make a copy of the original data so we can look at the result before and after side by side. So I'll do that here. Now let's plot the uh, data before and after doing the ICA artifact rejection. So I'm gonna plot the first five seconds again for the original raw and the uh, raw data that we just cleaned. So this is what that looks like. Um, this here, uh, what you see now is the original data with those large eye movement artifacts. We see those three large bumpy uh, little mountains in the first seven sensors. Now after ICA uh, artifact rejection, we can see that they're magically gone. So ICA is very effective at finding these strong muscle artifacts or eye movement artifacts and automatically um, getting rid of them from your data. Um, the only thing you have to do is to select the components in the decomposition. This is not automatic and this is something you have to do manually. And if you actually have an EOG channel uh, or an EMG channel, you can even automatically have a procedure select the appropriate ICA components to reject for you. So even this can be automated, but that's not gonna be subject of this uh, tutorial. So once we've gotten rid of eye movement artifacts or strong muscle artifacts, um, the next thing to do will be to find the time points in the data uh, when the visual and auditory stimuli were presented so that we can look at the brain activity surrounding those time points. And in MNE, when we have a, a, ch a stim channel, like, um, so in this case, it's, a, it's an analog channel that contains different the codes, so one, two, three, four, five, coding for different events, different stimuli that were presented. 
um, MNE has this find events function, which will get you a, a NumPy ND array um, containing the, the time points at which the events occurred. So we're going to run that. And then because these events are usually coded as numbers, but we want to, um, well, index into the um, uh, trials using something that we can understand. So natural language, uh, we wanna give them labels basically. Uh, we can assign a label to each number such that it makes sense, so, sense to us when we process the data further. So we're gonna create a little Python dictionary where we map um, a string to a number. So for example, the codes one and two refer to left and right uh, side auditory stimulation. And then from now on, we can use this uh, event diction, uh, these strings to basically get out all the trials that correspond to auditory stimulation of the left side or of the right side or visual stimulation of the left side or of the right side. And we can qualify this thing fully, so we can we can use the whole string, or we can just use auditory, uh, the string auditory, to get all all auditory trials, um, regardless of whether they're left or right side auditory stimulation. Hi, David. Just before we go into the good stuff of the visualization of the events, the ERPs, another thing, uh, we start having a few questions in the Q&A, mainly related to data. Mm -hmm. So we might want to address just so that we don't let people hanging behind. Um, so you should see the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. If you don't, I can uh, give you the questions, but I think that you can. Yeah, OK. So I see a number of questions. So the first question being, how raw is the data? Is it getting some sort of hardware filtering first? So do you mind just uh, talking just shortly about the data, data set, m &E. We know that people are downloading it. For some, it's slow. It seems to be a big data set, uh, one point something gigabytes. So if you can just tap into the, the, the data and then the questions. So I'm, I'm, I'm not quite sure what exactly the sampling frequency of this data is, um, but so usually an, an EEG data set won't be gigabytes large because EEG data is usually sampled at maybe, you know, 500 hertz. But because this data set has um, MEG uh, in it, um, it's usually sampled at a higher uh, sampling frequency. So MEG data is sample that maybe two kilohertz or so, or, or e even more, depending on, on what activity uh, one, you, you wanna analyze. So this, this is basically just has the anti-aliasing filter of the, um, of the EEG or MEG system applied to the data and no other processing has been done. Anti-aliasing means that for like 500 Hertz uh, sampling rate, uh, there'll be a, a filter which filters out, cuts off at a quarter of, around a quarter of the sampling frequency. Um, so the next question, what's the advantage need of eye artifact rejection if we do EOG channel subtraction? Well, we, we can do e EOG. So what, what I would use the EOG channel for is to select um, the uh, ICA components automatically that correspond to eye artifacts. There are plenty of other artifact rejection schemes, but this is probably the nicest thing you can do. So you would do an ICA decomposition and then use the EOG channel to you know, correlate the EOG channel with the ICA components and find those that correspond to eye movement artifacts. And then we don't need to do I, the segment rejection. So this segment marking and rejection, this is just um, something you can do additionally, but it's, it's actually not something that I like to do for my own uh, work. The difference between ICA and PCA is the criterion they use to, um, so they're both um, linear um, decompositions of the data. Um, they separate your data into some so-called latent components using a matrix multiplication. But the criteria by which they split the data up into components linearly split the data up is different. In ICA, the criterion is statistical independence of the components. 
And in PCA, the criterion is the amount of variance that the components explain. So in PCA, the components are ordered by largest variance at the top and smallest variance at the bottom. So basically how strong the signal is. And MNE actually applies a PCA decomposition before doing ICA, which is usually why the ICA components that you uh, click to reject are also ordered by um, power, by, by the amount of variance they explain in the data. Um, so 10 and 20 is just, I don't have a good rationalization for that, uh, for the number of ICA components. Um, it's just empirically, this is usually what people do. If you select too many ICA components, the algorithm can, cannot separate the data so well anymore. Um, the color representation, you're probably talking about the one you saw in the topography. So the different colors are the different sensors. It's just a way of easily being able to tell um, when you have the time series plotted uh, where on the head, so topographically speaking, the um, signal is coming from. Yeah, and then the question about automatically selecting independent components um, in an online experiment. Uh, so there are schemes for running ICA online. I'm, I'm by far not an expert on it um, because if the, if the statistics of the data change, then the decomposition has to change. So you can regularly run ICA in, in an online experiment and people do do this, but, and then you could use like an EOG channel to automatically select and reject the appropriate eye artifact components um, in such a scheme. Uh, yes, you can use uh, MNE without installing PyQt, but it's necessary for certain visualization functions. In particular, something we'll not, we won't cover here, it's necessary for doing uh, source reconstructions so we can look at EEG data at the sensor level, but we can also look at it at the source level. So we can use algorithms like beamforming algorithms, um, which are um, used to locate specific sources from an array of sensors. So if you wanna, like based on anatomical information and the way that the current spreads from a, a source like the visual cortex to the sensors, you can reconstruct that source. And if you would like to visualize these very fancy plots, then you would need PyQt, but this is not gonna be part of the tutorial uh, today. So, um, I'll uh, continue. So let's just check that the events that we read out from our analog channel, uh, that they're reasonable um, so that they are, um, that there aren't too many or too little of them. So we can use this convenience function uh, plot events to do that. I believe something just broke. So I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to restart my um, kernel. So in, in Visual Studio Code, if, if something, if you wanna run all the code above a certain cell, you just click here, run above, and it'll run everything above, which is like in IPython notebooks, Jupyter notebooks. So we get all the plots from before, but we've already seen them. So this is our uh, the plot with our events. So we have different colored events on the on the y axis. Um, the blue and the orange ones are are auditory stimuli, and on the x axis we have time and seconds and the green and the red ones are visual stimuli. So this looks about right. Uh, we have like 70 visual stimuli uh, of left and right side each and around 70 auditory stimuli of left and right side each. Each one here is a little dot. So that looks good. We can close that. We've correctly read in our events. So the next thing we're gonna do is to chop up our data into individual trials, so epochs. 
And um, in order to do so, we want to throw out the epochs that contain large artifacts. So we, we saw before that if we annotate um, bad segments of data, they'll automatically be thrown out. But maybe we didn't go through the data manually and we didn't catch all the artifacts. So another thing we can do to reject bad um, trials is to define um, signal um, amplitudes that are completely unrealistic for brain activity. So that they basically that they have to be uh, muscle or eye movement or some sort of environmental artifact. And what we're gonna, we can do this by um, defining a Python dictionary um, with uh, the key EEG and the value um, 150 uh, microvolt. Um, and for the EOG channel, um, 250 microvolts. So when, when, when the signal in those channels exceeds these values, uh, the trial, the epoch will be thrown out because it's almost certainly an artifact. And well, next we can actually construct an epochs object um, containing those trials that we just uh, read in during um, find events. So we pass it the raw object, we pass it the events um, array that we created. We need to pass it the dictionary, event dictionary, so that we can uh, just uh, um, refer to our events using strings instead of numbers. Uh, and of course, we have to pass this function um, a minimum time and a maximum time around the event uh, which defines the trial. So we're going to be looking at minus 0 0.2 seconds before stimulus presentation up to 0 0.5 seconds after stimulus presentation. Uh, we also pass it our reject criteria based on signal amplitudes, and we preload the data because this um, makes all um, um, all functions of this epox object available to us. If we don't preload the data, there are certain things that you won't be able to, to do directly because the data will not be loaded into your computer's RAM. It'll just sit on the disk. So this has the advantage that if you have a very large data set, uh, maybe you don't want to preload it, but then you also, for example, can't directly access the, the data as a NumPy, NumPy array. Um, you have to do stuff indirectly. So because this most, most computers should be good enough to handle this, we're just going to preload this data and we're going to construct our epochs object. Um, and the next thing we're going to do is to just uh, equalize the number of auditory and visual um, trials that we have, just so we have a fair comparison for the next plots. So this is actually not really an important thing, but it's a function that is available, this equalize event counts function. All it does is, is get the same number of trials for each. And then we can uh, split up the epochs object into, auditor into an auditory epochs object and a visual epochs object by just, um, um, well, indexing into the, the object using our string that we defined earlier. So auditory and visual. And we can then proceed to plot the individual uh, trials of auditory and visual stimulation, um, as well as their evoked responses. So on the left and the right, on the left you see um, auditory stimulation um, and on the right you see visual uh, stimulation. And so on, on the top plot, you see in the single trial data. And on the bottom plot, you see the average data with a, a measure of uncertainty. And basically, after, at this dotted line here, this is when the stimulus was presented and roughly 100 milliseconds after, so 0 0.1 seconds after, we see a dip in the signal at this um, EEG channel. So this says EEG 0 to 1, but actually it's a channel over the auditory cortex. 
I'm just telling you this now, but usually in your data sets, you'll have a proper channel name according to the 1020 system. So like um, some temporal channel, a channel containing the letter T. And in this channel, the signal dips right after the stimulus was presented, which we can see in the um, evoked response, but which we can also see by lining up the individual single trials. And a similar thing happens over the visual cortex, although we have this little spike, um, this po little positive spike before and after the dip. So the evoked responses look somewhat similar, um, although there are a few differences. So now we've seen individual trials uh, and the average response, um, but uh, usually we also wanna see a decomposition of the uh, brain's response to a stimulus in terms of uh, not just uh, time, the signal over time, but also the frequencies, the different frequencies over time. So this is called a time frequency decomposition of the data. And there are a few different methods uh, to do to do this, uh, all of them are basically available in MNE. So one thing you can do is do a short time Fourier transform where you do Fourier transforms over little windows of data. Um, and another thing you can do a very common, I think maybe the most common method is to do a wavelet transform. So uh, commonly used wavelets are Morley wavelets. So these are, these are just little sinusoidal shapes with a Gaussian envelope, little sinusoidal shapes that you um, multiply this by the signal with. You convolve these uh, wavelets with the signal. So it'll tell you how similar in, in frequency the signal is at a given time point to the wavelet. So the wavelet has a specific frequency and a specific number of cycles. And we define these frequencies here first by calling NumPy uh, A range. So what this basically does is uh, make an ND array with frequencies from seven to 30 Hertz in steps of three Hertz. Uh, so that's one parameter we need. Um, the, another parameter we need is the number of cycles of the wavelets. So when you have a very narrow wavelet, it's uh, very well localized in time, meaning it's very precise in time, but it's broad in frequency. So it captures quite a few frequencies, um, but it's very good in time. So in order to make the wavelet better in frequency domain, more precise in the frequency domain, you can extend the, the length of the wavelet, the number of cycles, but then it becomes worse in the time domain because you, you're, you're broader in the time. So basically there's this basic time frequency trade-off between time, um, time frequency analyses, um, meaning that um, the better you, the more precise you are in the temporal domain, the worse you are in the frequency domain, the more smeared you are. The better you are in the frequency domain, the more smeared you are in the time domain. So you can't have it both. For now, we're just gonna use two cycles of, um, of each frequency um, and we are not going to return the so-called intertrial coherence. We're just going to look at the amplitude uh, resulting from the wavelet transformation. So wavelets, um, wavelets can be uh, complex or, or real valued. And if you convolve the signal by a complex wavelet, you get a, a complex number back. And this complex number contains two pieces of information. It contains the amplitude, the instantaneous amplitude of the signal at that frequency, at that point in time, or it also contains the phase of the signal at that frequency, um, at that point in time. So we're not interested in phase information now, but the, just keep in mind that you can use these wavelet decompositions to calculate things like synchronization between different bearing areas or synchronization of the phase uh, across different trials. Um, so that's when the phase would be relevant. We're just gonna look at the amplitude now. And we can also decimate the, um, the data to reduce the, the number of, uh, the, the amount of, of uh, memory that this, this um, decomposition uses. Decimation means we just take 
Here, value three means we just take every third sample uh, to reduce the, the memory load of this of the structure that we create. And then we're gonna finally call the um, method plot for one of the sensors to look at the time frequency decomposition of the sensor. So this is a quite, a, we didn't select a very high uh, number of wavelets in, uh, in the frequency domain, but it gives you a basic impression of, of what you can see. Um, after time zero, at around eight Hertz. So this is the theta band. We see an increase in, in power uh, or amplitude, which then drops off again. On the, on the Y axis, we see the different frequencies. On the X axis, we see time. Now, after having done this um, time frequency decomposition, another thing we can do in MNE is to construct uh, evoked responses. So we can call the method average on our epochs object to get an evoked object. And we're gonna do this for auditory and visual uh, trials. And this will allow us to do some pretty cool visualizations of the um, average time series, uh, which will give us an idea of, of, of how, the signal, um, how the signal behaves on average. So first let's uh, call this method uh, plot joint. And I'll, I'll do this now uh, before explaining uh, what it is because it's better if you just look at the result. So I, I called this method plot join with uh, four or five time points. So 0, 0, 0 0.08, 0 0.1, and so forth. And this defines the time points for which we get a topographical plot of the signal. So let's look at this a little bit more closely. So again, the different colors here are the different uh, channels. Um, it's a little bit small, but you can see the uh, topographical arrangement of the channels um, in the top left of the lower uh, plot. So the purple channels are the, the occipital, pride occipital channels, and the green channels are the frontal channels. And we can see that the evoked response after the time zero, it sort of spikes in the parietal occipital areas. This is the um, auditory stimulation, by the way, parietal occipital and temporal areas, and it dips in the frontal areas. And we can look at this, um, that we can look at the ins instantaneous signal value um, at specific time points across the whole topography here at the top. These are the time points I defined when I called the function. And we can see that the signal sort of uh, increases in, in the back and at the sides, so parietal, occipital, temporal areas, and then subsides again, while at the end it sort of increases in the front. Um, so these, these sensors in the middle or in the front, these blue uh, greenish sensors here are, are the ones that you see as a blob in, in, a, in this um, central frontal areas. Now we can do the same for the visual evoked response just to see how that um, differs. Now we see a, a different uh, evoked response. Um, and a response which is more localized to uh, parietal occipital areas. So we see um, here in, in, at, at 80 and 100 milliseconds, uh, this, this increase in the signal value restricted to parietal occipital areas. And afterwards at around 200 milliseconds, it just starts spreading all over the brain. So we can see a slight difference between the evoked response due to an auditory stimulus and the evoked response due to a visual stimulus here. Now, uh, I'm gonna show you another type of visualization that we can do for these uh, evoked responses, or actually this visualization is just uh, to get the, the topo, topo plots, the topographical plots. Basically, this is the same thing we saw before, just without the, the uh, signal values. So perhaps this is something to be aware of, but 
not so interesting. Um, it's the same, basically the same kind of information we just saw earlier. Um, finally, what we can do is to plot the evoked response at all sensors arranged topographically. So that looks like this. And this is the, um, this is the visual stimulation condition. So this is the evoked response at each sensor in response to a visual stimulus. We see basically flat lines across central areas. And as we saw before, we see a response in parietal occipital areas and also frontal areas um, due to this visual stimulus. And in, we can click on any one of these sensors. So this is one of the sensors in the back. This would be uh, 01 in the 1020 system. And we have this nifty little slider um, in, in our plot where we can see in the bottom left corner of the screen um, in small text, the signal value at that point um, and the time which we are at. Here, the dotted line is the time point of presentation of the stimulus. So finally, uh, one thing to be aware of, especially when doing a sensor space EEG analysis is that the uh, signal you're measuring is a voltage and a, and a voltage is uh, with reference to a specific point. So it measures the electric potential at the sensor with reference to some other point on the head. And the specific rep choice of, of what you use as a reference is actually crucial in determining the shape uh, or the property of, of the signal that you get. So we're, go we're gonna look at what um, difference this uh, choice of reference sensor in EEG makes in the shape of the evoked response. And it can be absolutely massive. So we're gonna plot the evoked visually evoked responses using, using the original reference, which I assume was somewhere central here. And we're gonna plot it using a reference in the back of the head. And we're gonna see that the evoked responses are completely different. So this is the original reference um, signal with the original reference channel. We've already seen this. And this is the signal with the new reference channel. So if you look at this, you see the uh, purple, uh, well, the parietal occipital channels basically spiking and then dipping and then spiking again, and the uh, frontal green channels doing more or less the opposite. And when we use a different reference in the back of the head, suddenly the evoked response looks entirely different. So big take home message here is to beware of the reference channel to try out different references. Uh, one popular scheme is to use a so-called common average reference where you use the average of all channels um, as a reference for all other channels. And this is basically also the scheme that you will, would apply if you would do some source reconstruction methods. Now for, for linear classification purposes, this is, um, as far as I know, uh, I'm not quite sure about this, more or less irrelevant, but if you look at the EEG signal in sensor space, the choice of reference is crucial. So maybe you should look at some more of these um, questions. So we do have a couple of questions on ICA. I'm also looking at the time and knowing that, uh, so apparently ICA definitely hit a nerve in the, the good sense that people are really interested in, in knowing more, but knowing that this is not a, a technical or a, 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 I would say a tutorial on ICA and uh, some, uh, some of the, these techniques, um, I would keep these questions maybe 
further if at the, the, the end of the uh, today we have a bit of time because it's already almost four minutes before the time is over uh, but we'll definitely extend a bit more over because we do have a bit of a BCI uh, classification intro as well that David will be presenting and since this is a BCI 101 uh, we definitely want to go through uh, through that part as well so Today again, for those who were there, who were with us uh, for the past uh, two days, we'll run over time a little bit today as well. Uh, but we had uh, very, very good questions, very good content so far. Um, so I definitely didn't want to interrupt or stop anything. So uh, what I suggest, uh, David, is that you start with the, uh, the the BCI, and then we'll keep the question at the end. Um, and if you can do the, the run through the BCI stuff. I think that we have a couple of good things over there that the audience would like to would like to know. Maybe not going into the too deep in all the different things, and then we'll see what the with the remaining questions at the end. Sounds good. Okay, so I'll I'll try to keep it brief and and so for those that um, we're gonna that we're gonna lose in the meantime, uh, we hope to see you again in uh, week three. So if you had a hard deadline uh, at that time, where whether it's at two p.m. Eastern time or uh, your local time, we definitely hope to see you uh, to see you next week. This presentation will be available in YouTube as well, so you'll be able to catch the uh, the, the, the BCI part of it. Um, but hopefully, most people will be able to uh, to stay for uh, what I think is the the good the the awesome stuff after the good part. So all yours, uh, David. Okay, so um, now we're going to look at uh, a, a different um, um, script, this classification script, and here we're going to do a practical uh, BCI relevant exercise, uh, namely classifying um, motor imagery. So motor imagery is when a person imagines to move a limb. So it could be their foot, it could be their left or right hand. And today we're gonna to be classifying um, whether somebody imagined they're moving their right or their left hand. And people use these signals to control um, all sorts of uh, machines like uh, exoskeletons, for example. And this, this sort of imagination exercise uh, to control an exoskeleton is used, for example, in stroke rehabilitation. Um, so the very first thing, of course, is we're going to load another one of the uh, data sets available in MNE uh, where participants did left and right hand motor imagery. So I won't go into detail there, but I'm just going to load that data set. And in order to um, process it further, the um, functions below we'll need to know the exact sensor positions and we can load um, exact sensor positions from so-called montage files in MNE. Now we're going to load just the standard, uh, the 1005 is, is something similar to the 1020 but with more sensors. So we're going to load standard sensor positions just so that the uh, following MNE functions are, are work. Uh, and we're going to set that montage to in the raw data. So the motor imagery signal that we consider is called event related desynchronization. So what that is basically is around the time of, of movement, motor execution or motor imagery, we have a drop in the inhibition in the motor cortex. And these uh, inhibitory rhythms are in are the mu rhythm or the beta rhythm over over the motor cortex, and they basically drop in amplitude when you perform a movement because the cortex at that point is dis disinhibited, and you can measure the same drop in dis the same drop in inhibition um, when someone imagines they move their hand. And these, the mu rhythm is around 12 hertz and the beta rhythm is around uh, 20 to 30 hertz. So basically we're gonna look at power changes uh, in the motor cortex um, between seven and 30 hertz. So for that purpose, we'll filter our data between seven and 30 hertz. We could do this more specifically with the mu rhythm or the beta rhythm. So we could filter, for example, between 10 and 14 hertz or between 20 and 30 hertz. And that's something you could play around with later um, to see if you get a better classification accuracy if you zone in on either the mu rhythm or the beta rhythm. 
Um, in our lab, we, we focus just on the Mu rhythm to control our BCIs. Now we're gonna get the uh, um, events this time, unlike before in the earlier exercise, we're gonna get them from annotations. So what this means is that we don't have an analog channel where the signal codes for different uh, numbers, signal level codes for different numbers. These annotations are uh, basically digitally digital markers or digital triggers, which are available um, from the EEG system already. So for example, you might send the EEG system like a TTL pulse, which will be saved as a trigger marker, a digital trigger marker in the data. And in MNE Python, these are available as annotations. Um, so we're gonna use this events from annotations function. And we have two annotations in the data here, T1 and T2. And uh, we're gonna label them with the number zero, we're going to give them the code zero and one. Um, the reason for that is because this code zero and one can be used very easily in, in our classifier. We're also going to set up a, a picks. So this is just a, a list of channels. And we're going to pick the uh, EEG channels and basically exclude all the rest. Now, again, we first need to make trials that we're then going to classify. So we're going to look at um, minus one second to four seconds around the time point when the participant uh, started imagining moving their left or right uh, hand. And we're going to construct again, as before, an epox object from that. Furthermore, we're gonna, um, we don't want to train on the whole time segment because, well, we know from experience that the motor imagery signal is strongest. So this event-related desynchronization is strongest shortly after the participant starts uh, imagining movement. So to train our classifier, we're just going to, we're gonna create a copy of this epox object and we're gonna crop it down a little bit to just look at that critical time window when the difference in the signal power will be uh, maximal between the conditions. So we're gonna look at one second to two seconds after onset of the uh, motor imagery to train our classifier. And then we're gonna look at the performance of the classifier across the whole trial. Um, not just the segment that we train upon. So we have the separate epox object, which contains a cropped version of the of the trial, basically. And our labels will be um, the last uh, column in the events array, which contains basically the event code that we defined up here, zero or one. So we have zero for left-hand motor imagery and one for right-hand motor imagery. So I'll run that. And then we need to basically construct a classifier. Um, but before we construct a classifier, we should follow proper machine learning protocol and we should do something called k-fold uh, class cross-validation. So typically in machine learning, you have a training uh, set, a training data set, some number of data points and a test data set. Um, because you, the, the machine learning classifier will, will fit to one, will, will characterize one particular data set very well. And then you need a separate data set to test how well it performs on examples that it has not seen before. And to make optimal use of, of our limited number of trials, I think we have maybe around 80, 90 or, or so here, uh, we're going to split up the, the um, data that we have here into 10 groups. So CV stands for cross-validation, and this uh, function shuffle split, or this object shuffle split, um, comes from one of the most uh, well-known um, and very well-made well, well um, Python machine learning toolboxes called sklearn. So sklearn is, is uh, a great uh, starting point for doing machine learning in Python. 
and it offers a lot of convenience functions such as this one which allows you to split up your data set into 10 different groups and then what what it, what it will do with these 10 groups is it'll get nine groups as training data and test on the remaining group um, so these are called folds 10 fold cross validation and it'll do that 10 times in that way, uh, you get basically a, you, you make the maximum possible use of your data instead of just splitting it once into a training into, and into a test set. You get a much better idea of how well the classifier really performs on data points that it has not seen before. So after calling the method split on this, um, on this uh, of this object, uh, we get um, indices that correspond to the different different splits of the data. So, if you want to know more about that, just uh, I, guess, I guess read up on it. Um, this that can get quite technical, and it's not really the point here. Um, and well, now after we've uh, got we have our our training and our test sets, we need to actually construct a classifier that we we train uh, to predict whether a trial uh, was left or right hand motor imagery. And we're, we're going to use a very common scheme um, in e the eGPCI field. So we're going to use the common spatial patterns algorithm for feature selection. And we're going to use a linear discriminant analysis as the classifier. So what the common spatial patterns algorithm does, um, it's a spatial filter, which takes the 64 EEG channels and weights them appropriately to more or less point at a source, uh, which shows a maximal power difference between the two conditions. So I predict that when we run this, uh, it'll point at the motor left and right motor cortex um, because those will show the event-related uh, power change, the event-related desynchronization that will basically tell us whether the left or the right hand uh, was imagined to be moved. Um, so after doing this common spatial patterns, here we got set the number of components to four we're going to have, instead of 64 EG channels, we're going to have four, um, four cha virtual channels and corresponding to sources in the motor cortex that show this power difference. And then to actually uh, tell us whether this a, a particular trial was uh, a left or right hand motor imagery trial, we're going to use the linear discriminant analysis uh, classifier. So, in sklearn, um, we fit the classifier to data using the fit uh, function or the fit transform function. Um, transform actually returns uh, the, the, the trial, um, the transformed version of the trial. So in, in the case of common spatial patterns, it'll project the 64 channels to the four virtual channels. Um, Normally, this is returned by the function, so we, we could write here, for example, um, hidden components. Some, we could write something like this, but we're not, we're not using the transform part. We could also just call the fit part. Um, so we, we give it the epoch data, which, we, which is um, the, a NumPy array. So crucially, it has to be a NumPy array, and we get this NumPy array, so it's... Um, epochs, um, channels, time. We get this NumPy array from, uh, by calling the, the get data function of the epoch structure. Um, so the C CSP uh, classifier actually doesn't come from sklearn itself. It comes from the MNE decoding um, part. This is important because in sklearn, normally you have uh, all data is, is a number of time points and then number of features. So actually we have three different axes here. We have epochs, channels, time, um, and this isn't handled by sklearn classifiers. So this, we use this common spatial patterns, um, uh, feature selection, uh, object from the MNE toolbox. This is not from sklearn. 
So we call this on the epox data. And then once this is uh, trained or fit to the data, we can plot the topographical patterns that um, it finds us. So we, we get four hidden components in the data, four features that we extract from the 64 um, channels. And they have a specific topography, which should be interpretable. And I predict that they'll point to the left and right uh, motor cortex. So I ran into some, oops. So these are basically the uh, weights given to each channel to construct each of these features, these hidden components. And we can see in the very first uh, component that the left, well, pre-motor area, I would say, is um, lit up. So this means that this, is the, this first component basically gets to a source in the left motor cortex and this, uh, or left premotor area. And this uh, third component here focuses in on a source in the right um, premotor area. Now these, these second and fourth components, they don't seem to be so informative, but we're gonna keep them anyway because it doesn't hurt. And a standard procedure in, in using the common spatial patterns algorithm for, for feature selection, is uh, to use four components. So many people do this and we're just gonna keep all these four. But the important thing to keep in mind is that the first and the third are the ones which will probably tell our classifier um, whether the left or the right hand um, has, whether motor imagery has been done with the left or the right hand. So there are a, a number of um, loops that I'm gonna run through here. Um, I won't explain in detail what they are, but basically they apply the classifier in, in a windowed fashion to uh, different time points. So we're gonna get a classification accuracy uh, for different windows of time. And we're gonna see how the classifier accuracy changes with, with time around the, um, the go moment when the participants started the motor imagery, started imagining moving either the left or right hand. And now finally, we can um, plot the classification accuracy over time. So here the dotted line again is when, when the participant was given the go signal to start the motor imagery and roughly one to one and a half seconds um, after um, they started imagining movement, the classifier was able to decode whether it was the left or the right hand uh, being imagined with about you know eighty to ninety percent accuracy. So that's that's pretty good. So with ninety percent accuracy, we can decode here um, which hand the participant. Um, imagined uh, to move. Awesome. So should we go through the questions? Uh, yes. So sh should I go through all the ICA questions? I'll just go through uh, right. Uh, may, maybe kind of keep them for for the end and pack an answer unless unless you feel like, like going into uh, into details. But uh, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll let you judge. Okay. So Mohit writes synchronicity in two EEG signals from two different areas stimulate participants apart from cross correlation and phase. What are parameters of synchronicity between two EEG signals? Well, synchronicity refers to oscillatory brain activity. So to me, synchronicity means that we look, we look at um, phase locking and actually measuring phase locking is absolutely not trivial because one of the problems in EEG is for example, volume conduction. So uh, a, a source somewhere on the head uh, will spread current all over the scalp, and you'll basically be measure be able to measure the same source from multiple different points, and then it'll look like 
two different electrodes are synchronized when in fact they completely aren't. So there are different, uh, there are a number of different publications on measuring phase locking in EEG and some approach to avoid the effect of volume conduction. So this is instantaneous zero phase locking, if you will, um, is, is to um, basically ignore sources that are, or ignore phases that are, are coupled at, at zero. And m and &E has, a, has a, a wide number of these um, measures of synchrony integrated. Uh, you can check the website, it has, it has great tutorials and you can compare different, um, if you have some of these example data sets, which you also find in the tutorials, you can easily compare different measures of, of synchrony uh, with each other. So yeah, to me, synchrony is about, about phase. And of course, there are other measures to compare for, for functional connectivity, but that, um, that would get quite complicated quick, I guess. So ICA is not only used for artifact correction, no. Um, ICA is also used to uh, separate different brain sources. Um, so there's a very nice paper um, which shows that physiological brain sources are usually dipoles in the um, ICA decomposition when we look at the topographies. Um, so by dipole, I don't mean a dipole in the front here because a dipole in the front here is usually an eye movement artifact, but dipoles that are you know, reasonably within the head um, usually correspond to distinct physiological um, sources and ICA can be used to separate different physiological sources. So perhaps if you applied ICA to, to this motor imagery data, you'd get um, sources corresponding to left and right hand motor imagery. That's uh, quite a reasonable hypothesis, actually. You can go and, and, and try this out. So the difference between EEG lab and ME Python is that EEG lab is for, for MATLAB and ME Python is for Python. Um, they're both very well developed toolboxes. I think EEG lab is, is in, even more mature, if, if I'm correct. Um, they both offer most of the functionality you'll need for EEG analysis, but I prefer coding in Python because it, I just like the language a lot more than, than MATLAB. So it depends on whether you prefer MATLAB or Python. Um, so a recommendation for a book is um, by Mike X. Cohen, if you're looking for a signal processing. So I, th I think it's really good to get a basic uh, knowledge on, on um, electrophysiological signal processing. Um, and a very um, intuitive uh, introduction to the topic is, is given by Mike X. Cohen. I, I don't remember exactly the name of the book, but if you Google Mike X. Cohen, you'll find his book on basically EEG analysis. And he goes through all, those, all these um, topics like, like wavelet decompositions and, and so forth. That's, I guess that's the book you... Yes, exactly. Yeah, this this would, one, yes. I would definitely recommend as well. A really good book. And I know that in the chat, um, in the, the book also, the Stephen Locke for more ERP stuff has been recommended as well. Uh, and I would definitely echo that in some of the, so you have more on the frequency stuff in the Cohen's book. And obviously, uh, Stephen G. Locke, who doesn't need introduction, the ERP world is also a good uh, recommendation. Um, so the next question was, which, which movement precisely? Is it just open fist closing as usual? So usually motor imagery is, is done um, by first having participants perform motor execution. So they'll do this grasping motion and you can give them one of these exercise tools to do the grasping motion. And then after a while, you'll ask them to stop actually performing the movement and simply imagine performing the movement. And yeah, when it's hand motor imagery, usually it's the sort of grasping uh, motion, open closing a fist. 
Um, the next question is, is it possible to make a custom electrode arrangement and overlay on a non-human model uh, for animal experiments? So this is possible in MNE Python, but it probably requires a lot of tinkering and coding and anything is possible. The toolbox is open source. The community is very supportive. If you'd like to get into coding um, MNE Python for, for alternative uses, I encourage you to do so if you have the time. Um, and I, the code base that exists is, uh, it's very easy to adapt and it's well documented. So I'm, I'm sure this is possible, but there are not there. I don't think there are any um, preset um, or, or off the shelf methods for, for what you, for animal experiments, what you intend to do, unfortunately. Mm. So there are basically the next question is about common spatial patterns and whether there are other techniques to use for feature extraction. Um, yes, there are other techniques, um, but the common spatial patterns algorithm is basically probably the single most popular um, algorithm in the BCI field. It just works extremely well. Um, it's based on comparing the covariance matrices of two classes. So these, these spatial filters that the common spatial patterns algorithms use um, just and basically it does an eigenvalue decomposition of these two co covariance matrices of the two classes. And this is a, a sort of a very basic uh, procedure which works very well and is usually quite robust in many applications. And there are a number of tweaks to, to this uh, scheme which you know make it more robust in certain situations. But other than that, um, there aren't really any alternatives that, that people use so much because it just works so well. Mm, do I need a research grade BCI device to collect EG data? That depends on the signal, depends on your outcome measure. So it really depends on what you want to um, do. There are um, low cost EG devices available. Um, there are EG devices, commercially available ones that use dry electrodes, but depending on the signal of interest, um, they may work or they may not. So it, this question, I cannot give a, a, um, a general answer to this question because it really depends on, on what exactly you're trying to measure. So if you wanna measure a really strong signal like alpha waves, yeah, probably um, you can use pretty much any um, EEG system. But if you wanna measure for example, gamma band activity in, in the 30, 40, 50 Hertz range, um, you're probably gonna need something that um, where, where the signal to noise ratio is as, as good as it can get. So that really depends. Um, and we do decoding on single epoch continuous data. So you, in, in order to do decoding, you need to train the classifier with a large or sufficient number of trials. So if you just have one single um, epoch, you need to have a pre-trained classifier. Um, and if you just have a raw uh, data structure, you need to cut it up into uh, trials first in order to train your classifier. So there's, Basically, there's no way around um, around training the classifier somehow by feeding it a large number of trials, which are epochs. So the next question asks um, for brain-computer interfacing specifically, whether the, what, what sort of artifact rejection procedures exist. I, I personally don't work on BCIs, so I cannot answer that question for you, unfortunately. I don't know. Um, maybe someone else has expertise in this area and would like to comment on what sort of artifact rejection procedures are used. So I, for, for my closed loop experiments, when, when I read in or, or I have a machine connected to, so I, I do do some kind of BCI, but not the conventional BCI. What, what I do is I apply the um, Laplace filtering or current source density mapping. 
And this is a good way to get rid of a lot of artifacts. Um, it's also just a spatial filter and it doesn't need to be trained or so. It's, uh, it just needs basically the sensor position and then it stays static throughout time. And what the spatial filter does is calculate the local uh, derivative of the voltage. So it gets you basically the current density so it gets you a local change in the signal and it attenuates uh, far away sources. So it gets rid of this volume conduction problem. Um, it's, I mean, it doesn't get rid of it. It significantly helps with volume conduction and it can attenuate a lot of artifacts just by this very simple spatial filtering procedure. So if you check mne.preprocessing. Um, compute current source density, you can easily apply this Laplace filtering, otherwise known as current source density mapping to your EEG data. And you can see um, how well it attenuates certain artifacts. And that's something you can easily apply online. And that's what I, that's basically the only thing I do for my online experiments. Um, Do you know signal smoothing and denoising techniques used for neurofeedback? So I personally do not work on normal neurofeedback, but as I mentioned, denoising, I use just the, the uh, current source density mapping, Laplace filtering. And I know from other people that, that work on, on neurofeedback stuff that Basically, this is the only thing they do. They just they just do a Laplace filter and then they they proceed with the rest of their signal processing pipeline. So what what you can do is is use like EOG channels to incorporate conditions into your BCI to not react when the when the person is is performing large eye movements when there are artifacts. You can use maybe EMG channels to um, to not react when it's actually just an artifact. But I'm, I'm not the expert in this and perhaps someone else would like to answer. We've gone through all the questions. Uh, I'm sure there are many more and uh, I would invite people to go on the Slack platform if they'd like to uh, continue discussion, have more questions. Um, David, you can stop uh, sharing your screen. I would like to thank you once again for uh, this amazing talk, amazing presentation. Um, I will share the link of his lab once again, uh, if you wanna follow him on uh, LinkedIn as well, you have all the information in the chat at the moment. Um, just to announce the last week of our series, I would like to uh, invite uh, Sophie to take the mic. In the meantime, uh, if you uh, guys would like to see more of these um, workshop, more ends on, please reach out either via Slack, via email, info at neurotechx.com and let's, let, let us know what kind of content you'd like to, uh, to learn. Is it more on the technical side, more we had a lot of questions on ICAs. Um, so please let, let us know uh, what, we could, uh, what we could help with and what kind of events you'd like to see in the future. Uh, but in the meantime, we already have our schedule for week three. So, Sophie. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Yannick. Um, that was an absolutely fascinating talk. I've, I've definitely learned a lot um, and you, you, you make it look really, really easy. Um, just to say hi, everyone, and do join us for our third week, next week of BCI 101. We've had a fantastic week one and we're rounding up with a fantastic week two. Um, and for week three, we're going to be looking at BCIs in industry. So we've got talks for you on Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday. Um, first of all, we'll be looking at what it takes to build a BCI product um, for a developer and, and research kit type product. Then we'll be looking at consumer and clinical products and finally we'll be having a deep dive into some people with fantastic careers in the BCI industry um, and they'll be reflecting on what they've done to get there and what their experiences have been like so do check it out you can see information um, within the slack channels that we've got listed there in the chat do definitely join us and I have heard that the neurobar will also be back it's not one to miss so definitely come and join us for that Yannick back to you Awesome. Yeah, I think that the neural bar stayed open for like five hours or something yesterday. Uh, a little crazy. I'm pretty sure the, the barmen today are pretty uh, are resting. Um, so uh, a lot of uh, awesome conversation were, were had. So join us next week. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, we're available on Slack, 
uh, thank, thank you once again, David, for this amazing presentation and uh, for all the audience that stayed with us until uh, the very end. So on this, I'll end the live stream on YouTube and the webinar. Thank you very much, everybody.